So when we booked the ISA last year for today, the idea of the festival was not simply to demonstrate and communicate fe fe uh, findings from our research program, but to use the dynamics that organizing such a big event generates to formulate the great story, what are we about, what have we found. And the panels were carefully chosen to allow us to explore such lateral thinking. So we commissioned specific pieces, for example, on the voices of primary creators and the work packages within Create, which look, look at primary production. Um, but we also commissioned uh, a specific piece on, on business models, and we try to integrate findings across very different projects, methods, and disciplinary traditions. And it's one of the great privileges as a, of being the director of Create that I was gaining almost by chance an overview of the best uh, research on copyright and innovation. Ours is a globally unprecedented project. We allow disciplines such as behavioral economics, ethnography, computer science, and law to talk to each other. And pretty soon after we started, we got approaches from all around the world <clears throat> with ideas, suggestions for projects. And very quickly, <clears throat> it, be <clears throat> it became clear that we have an opportunity to integrate, but also be more than the UK center. We, we can be an ambassador for the world. And I hope today we'll have a chance to explore some of the resources we created. <clears throat> And we can claim that anybody who engages with our field of research now, by default, will end up on one of our digital resources, whether it's copyrightuser.org for guidance, whether it's copyrightevidence.org for a catalog of interdisciplinary work of empirical impact, uh, or whether it's the primary sources project we started many years ago at Cambridge with Lionel Bentley, so um, copyrighthistory.org. So, as a default engaging in our field of research now, I think we have achieved um, already a change in, in the, the landscape. So let me turn now to the, the first panel, the future of copyright. I felt I should not sit on the fence, but start the discussion today with a summary of what I think the Create Research Program has found on a number of depressing copyright questions. And I must warn you, not all of that is pretty. Copyright discourse suffers from a distorted worldview. And before I hand over to Julia Reda and Lionel Bentley, I'll aim to contrast four central beliefs many people hold about copyright law and its workings with the empirical picture as it emerged through the Create Research Program. So I entitled this um, bravely, Four Inconvenient Truth and um, About Copyright. And Tony Clayton from our advisory council yesterday told me this is really all what policy is all about. It's about dealing with inconvenient truth. So, any European, anybody coming out of the tradition of the Bern Convention is familiar with the creator doctrine. You know, the idea that really copyright is there for the creator, the creator is the first owner of, of, of the work, and um, we find it in recitals of European legislation, um, and uh, in my preparation for uh, Brexit, I also put up the Bern Convention. Um, but so the, the, the idea is that the independence and dignity of the author in some ways is fostered and secured by giving them exclusive rights. And in some ways allow them to make a living uh, from their endeavors. So the empirical picture, as it emerges, um, looks rather more complicated. So here are some of the, the key findings, um, and um, you may or may not be familiar with some of this, but I, I think it's important to realize that winner take all markets are the way markets are structured in the cultural industries. So little differences in, in talent, little differences in make a huge effect um, you want to listen to and communicate with the same things your friends and neighbors communicate, which accelerates this. And the, the distribution of income is quite extreme. Uh, the top 10% of creators um, earn the largest uh, share of the pie. It's different in different sectors, but as a general finding, that is right. Um, the median earnings are low. They are probably uh, bordering minimum wage. Um, <laughs> Portfolio lies are typical. People do more than one thing. And uh, also, global assignments are very prevalent. 
Interestingly, also emerging from the Kuwait research is that for creators, copyright doesn't really mean something legal for many. It's, it has something to do with how, with how they feel them, up, about themselves as creators. Um, and there's a great variation in practice between different sectors, between fashion and video games. For example, in, if you go to uh, Andrew McGrobby's workshop later today, you will find that, that copying is built into the training of the fashion industry in a particular way, which uh, is very different than to, to, to other sectors. Um, on a slightly different tangent, our empirical research um, by Shona Boro on the, on the IPEC small claims track has shown that this has almost become a photographer's court. So 40% of the claims launched there are by photographers, and um, so maybe copyright this gives them control and a means of earnings. If you want to find out more about that, you have to go to the litigation workshop. So <clears throat> if statutory ownership is, is not really the, 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 the heart of the game, but the contractual arrangements between creators and their investors, exploiters, in legal term of the meaning of that term. Policymakers should always be as suspicious if representatives speak in the name of the creator. They should ask first that whoever comes to them to explain the contracts and the royalty flows in their sector. So any, anybody who approaches a policymaker on behalf of the creators should be asked back that simple question. I move now to the second inconvenient truth. It is the role of the consumer in the copyright debate. So this is in some ways a reflection of the copyright wars here. We've had 20 years since the emerging of the internet of the MP3 files as navigator internet browser appeared in 1995. So we had 20 years now of, of desperate intervention to get you know, the thing back into the box and, um, and to control how people behave in an online environment. Um, these are just some of the measures. Some have disappeared again. Yeah, the graduated response, um, DIM strategies, there's certainly certain legal strategies which have not delivered at all. So what's the empirical picture on the role of the consumer in, in copyright law? Well, um, if you look and use our data exploration tool, uh, Omeba, online media, Explorer, um, Analytics Behavior Explorer, um, which allows you to interrogate the infringement tracker studies which the uh, Ofcom IPO with the Kantar Consultancy has done since uh, um, uh, the last, uh, since 2013. Um, you will find that the, the top spenders, the top infringers, and the top legal consumers are all the same people. Okay? Top infringers, top spenders, Top legal consumers are all the same people. And who are they? They're people between the age of 12 and 15. OK? So I mean, that this is really a striking finding. I mean, this is consistent with that there may be an over old decline in, 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 in the sales. But it gives you a, a really strange kind of uh, different angle to analyze what kind of strategies might work to increase spending. That's what the creative industries want. So the critical question for the creative industries is how to reach those who are willing to spend and what makes those who are not willing to spend change their mind. So unless you understand the behavior of your consumers, enforcement measures cannot be, in, uh, be effective and they could even be counterproductive. So Joost Porters in the room has done a study uh, in the Netherlands um, where he showed um, strikingly that the introduction of, of streaming service in the Netherlands led to a, 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 a drop in the um, piracy rates quite rapidly from 38% in 2008 to 27% uh, in 2012. So this business enforcement, uh, responses to enforcement can, can work. And I should say there has been a, a movement uh, in, in the creative industries and also among what are, you know, the, the copyright, received copyright interests that we have to address this area differently. Copyright copying is theft is no longer the message which we hear all the time. And in our workshop, um, the, the Copyright Education and Awareness Symposium we organized with industry and, and um, uh, the support of the IPO. Um, some of the, the, the new insights in this area has come, have come out, and you can, again, um, follow that up in one of the workshops. 
this is the Omnibar online media uh, tool. Again, you can explore that outside. So the next aspect in which the role of the consumer is not accurately conceptualized up to now in the copyright debate is that the copyright consumer and user is not passive. It's not a recipient. It is somebody in the digital world who plays an increasingly productive role. And the empirical evidence suggests that non-commercial engagement is um, in transformative uses in parodies is associated with greater sales of the products which are being treated. Um, and there are also uh, societal and cultural reasons why we want to have active rather than passive users um, that came out in the Hargreaves review, but also in some of our projects um, which I uh, refer to here. So freedom of expression is something that needs to be taken seriously in this context as well. It's not only an a economic question. And for research and education, um, it's almost tried to say that this is not, you know, use is not passive. It's an essential part of, uh, of creating new knowledge. And with respect to copyright exceptions, there appears to be a link between the use of data mining techniques in countries and the permissis, permissiveness of a country's copyright system. So what people do in, in the field of research is linked to the way the copyright system is structured. And again, this is something which needs to be taken extremely seriously. So we're now turning to the third inconvenient truth. It relates to copyright and non-use. So this is an image from a well-known study by Paul Heald, who's also part of the Great Consortium um, from the University of Illinois, and it illustrates a black hole in the 20th century. So this is specific to, to, to the US system, where everything before 1923 is out of copyright. In Europe, it's a much more gradual, um, so the graph would look different. But it, the, 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 the beauty, methodological beauty of using the US system is that you can actually um, control the, ch the change in, uh, in, in the law, because there's one specific date. And you see here that um, anything which has been published before 1923 um, is much more likely to be there. So, so, and it's this very strange, I mean, from a commercial perspective, it's very surprisingly strange that works from the 19th century would be more demanded in the market than from the 1950s. Why should that be? Um, and uh, so I think we have to take seriously that copyright law has an effect on the availability of material which is still protected but no longer commercially exploited. And as a premise, it cannot make sense to run a system which makes things or keeps things disappeared. There's no value in a work that's protected and not used. And I think we should achieve a consensus across it should be possible to achieve a consensus across society that this is not an acceptable situation. So I give you a lot more figures which all point in the same direction, really. You know, that after 50 years, only 2.3% of books are still commercially available, 7% of films. Um, and, uh, but, but all this is completely intuitive. Once one tunes one's ear to that, it's quite clear that this is the picture of the world we are living in. So, also as part of a CREATE project which was uh, co-funded by the ESRC and also co-funded by the IPO, we tried to quantify what the, quant the public domain effects would be. So if materials are available without permission, what is the economic effect of that? And that um, we did that, um, this again, I worked with Paul Heald, um, by looking at the use of public domain images on Wikipedia and um, what effect the use of these images has on the traffic to the websites and then applying license fees to, to the difference. Um, this is really an exercise, a methodological exercise to show that it's possible to put an economic value on using stuff without permission, which never had been done before. So I think as a, as a, as a methodological innovation, as a conceptual shift, this is uh, Im important work, if I may say so. Last contribution to copyright and non-use. We have another project at the University of Glasgow, um, Kerry Patterson, who is also, I think, in the room. Um, so this tries to, as a rights clearing exercise, explore what is involved in making these scrapbooks by the Scottish poem, 
poet uh, Edwin Morgan available online. There are quite a lot of pages involved here. It's, uh, uh, scrapbooks uh, you know, was a, a form of expression which was more prevalent in 1940s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It's a form of, of commenting on the world, reflecting the world, and, and aesthetically it, it's something sometimes surrealist, sometimes more commenting on, 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 on events, and this is roughly, well, there's a few examples of pages. So by clocking the time Carrie Patterson spent on this, by vigorously um, logging every communication with right holders, asking for license fees under different schemes, um, including the, the UK often uh, work scheme, um, we arrived at a figure what it would cost to legitimately digitize and make online available these works. And you can see them here. Um, one of those things which are not looking pretty. A single person would take 12 years to clear the scrapbooks. And it would cost you more than 200,000 pounds to do that. So I think we need to establish that non-use must have consequences and it should be possible to achieve a consensus on this principle. Rights come with obligations and we need to find more effective me mechanisms of releasing works which are currently not used. My last point um, relates to evidence-based policy making. So there has been a shift in the discourse. I mean, evidence-based policy making is now much more prominent as, as a, 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 an ambition and as a requirement. So for each new law, there need to be the impact assessments, both at UK and European levels. But um, some of them are done after the event, as we know. And sometimes also the, the independent studies which are commissioned are overturned in, in, in the policy decision. I mean, all of this is not entirely illegitimate, but, um, but it's worth noting that copyright law and changes in copyright law have been really dominated by a particular form, form of rent seeking. And in the European Parliament, I gave this example. So this is a, a really innocent looking paragraph on, on um, joint authorship co-authorship, which was sneaked into the um, Term Extension Directive for Sound Recordings. And there, um, we have that the author of the lyrics and the composer of the music compositions, provided that both have contribution made, will then be calculated as by, from, from the date of the later of the two. So that means in the, in the case of, of summertime, that something which would have been out of copyright for a long time, a long time ago, um, has come back via the text writing of, of Ira Gershwin. And this particular law channeled millions of pounds, euros, dollars into the estate of George Gershwin, which promptly auctioned, re-auctioned the publishing rights for, for his catalog. So, this kind of thing, you know, it's not aware, there's no public debate about it, uh, but this kind of thing has happened in copyright law quite a lot. It's quite a lot. Somebody managed to get a phrase into law which changed the, the monetary flows in the industry without clear transparency and discussion how this would affect what we do. Okay, so this is a plug for the evidence wiki, so we try to... Um, create an, an open infrastructure which allows to catalog all empirical evidence bearing on copyright policy from various disciplinary fields. It's an open structure so people can propose studies which are then catalogued. So you can work out actually in which areas do we know what, on what basis. And what we t took great care is, is uh, cataloging the methods transparently so you can actually see on which basis these studies are done. Okay, to conclude, the four inconvenient truths about copyright. So, on the independence and dignity of the artist, which is received wisdom, the inconvenient truth is that ownership conditions do not define working conditions, it's contracts, and the concerns of creators and investors are not harmonious. So, this area needs to be looked at quite differently. On the consumption aspect, that copyright law is all about controlling what the consumer does, um, the uncomfortable truth is that, that consumption in the digital world is not passive, and it's important that it is not passive. And that's both true from a commercial strategy, 
that those who are the most unruly also spend the most, but it's also true that creative reuse has enormous benefits economically, socially, and culturally, and we don't understand this at all. So there's work needs to be done here. On the third inconvenient truth, well, the inconvenience here is that copyright law keeps works disappeared. And that right holders are less reliable guardians of our heritage than the public domain. The empiric picture is entirely clear and unequivocal. So we need to develop uh, better mechanisms for releasing unused works. Lastly, copyright policy lacks an independent evidence base. Well, I hope we have contributed to changing the picture a little, but what is important that these effects, which are now much more documented and supported by primary data and by a wide range of methodological approaches, um, that they become so strong that policymakers cannot just rebut them with an anecdote or a little paragraph which they've been given to insert in a law. So I think we are quite far from a situation where the empirical picture influences policy, but we are hopefully not as far from that as we were. Okay, so I set out the stall, I think, on four aspects. There are many more Crate has done, but these are four aspects which speak directly to the future of copyright law. And my challenge really to, to Julia Reda and Lionel Bentley was um, to think about how um, this empirical picture that has emerged here, you know, does it matter for the way copyright law would um, develop in the future? I know that given where we are today, um, this may not be what we hear, but uh, it's certainly something where we would want to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this very kind introduction. It is a great honor to speak here today on what is certainly a historic day for Britain and for Europe. Uh, I want to lend my full support to CREATE because I think it is doing incredibly valuable work to provide politicians like myself with uh, empirical evidence. And I realize we may not have the best track record in listening to that evidence in practice. Um, we have all woken up uh, to a very different Europe today. And I think our common goal of improving public policy has just become a bit harder. Uh, I, so I have to warn you that uh, I think this occasion does call for a political speak. Uh, I do realize that I get invited to academic conferences quite a lot because I do take a rather academic approach uh, to copyright uh, in my own work. So uh, for those of you who have come here expecting uh, an academic uh, treatise, uh, you can be relieved that I will be spending some minutes uh, talking about text and data mining and the temporary copying exception. So I think there will be something there for everybody. Um, when I spoke at uh, the EPIP conference in Glasgow last year, uh, together with Ian Hargreaves, uh, we talked about the prospects of uh, copyright reform through incremental change. And uh, today, when looking at the progress that uh, has been made on the European copyright reform since then, I do have to admit that uh, calling it incremental would be a bit of an overstatement. Uh, it's been two years since the Commission has uh, taken up its uh, five-year mandate, and we're still waiting for a proposal to be presented to the Parliament to start its work on the copyright reform. And I think increasingly it seems like the options available to us to address uh, many of the fundamental problems with copyright today, that's uh, problems in the area of research, problems with transaction costs, uh, problems with the digital transformation of society, these problems actually cannot be sufficiently addressed uh, through just a European copyright reform alone. Uh, we all agree that uh, nobody would have drafted uh, the copyright law as it exists today on a blank sheet of paper and came up with what we actually have today. But uh, what we can't agree on up till now is uh, how to get out of this mess and how to move forward. So uh, this is because to a large extent um, the copyright law that we have in Europe today is constrained by international treaties. And um, this leaves us a limited room of maneuver. Uh, in my copyright report, uh, the European Parliament has outlined many small and pragmatic incremental steps that can be taken, but a paradigm shift that would take fu into full account all the evidence that has just been presented to us uh, would have to go way beyond that, I believe. Um, 
I think this is perhaps best illustrated by one of uh, the elements of the reform that we're discussing in Europe today that would seem like a rather minor detail but is actually taking up a huge part of the discussion and that is uh, the exception for text and data mining. Um, I think this exception is at best a workaround, a tool to mitigate the problems of an incredibly widely cast exclusive right that uh, give rights holders the same level of control over a digital copy that it gives over an analog copy. And uh, the text and data mining is actually not uh, the first exception that serves this very purpose of trying to somehow rein in the exclusive right. Um, the, we can look at the only mandatory exception in uh, European copyright uh, in, uh, directive uh, that is the uh, exception for temporary copies that are integral to a technological process. I think this uh, exception it has been proven absolutely fundamental to digital technology. Uh, the way that I like to explain the significance of this exception is uh, with an example from a friend of mine uh, called Enno who is wearing a cochlear implant which is a digital hearing aid. And uh, this digital hearing aid uh, is implanted into his brain and transforms a sound in the air into a digital signal. Now, if we didn't have uh, the exception for temporary copies in copyright law, he would be committing copyright infringement every time he were listening to a piece of music. Now, obviously, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, and thankfully, this is not the case. But uh, I do think it shows that uh, there is a, a fundamental difference between analog and digital copies in the way that digital copying is at the core of any digital technology. So I think in a way the text and data mining exception that we're discussing today serves a similar purpose. Like the temporary copying exception, it allow, uh, uh, like the temporary copying exception allows my friend Enno uh, to listen to music um, with the help of a computer, the text and data mining allows researchers to read with the help of a computer. Um, that it interferes with the copyright protection at all is a bit of an accident, I believe. Uh, in order to efficiently run an algorithm over a large body of works, uh, it's just the most efficient way to first make a copy of those works into a database, but uh, that's really all that is to it, why it is coming into conflict with copyright law in the first place. Uh, I don't think uh, it's easy to argue how text and data mining would actually create a prejudice to the author. So it seems quite absurd that uh, such an essential activity of modern um, research in the digital world would be left in a legal gray zone just to, place a few, uh, to please a few academic publishing houses that are already amongst the most profitable companies in the world. So uh, I am quite optimistic that an exception will be adopted uh, on this topic soon, but it is just treating a symptom of the problems that arise from international copyright law that defines a global copyright system based on the act of copying, although this is quite a questionable approach in the digital age. Uh, the, temporary ex uh, the temporary exception for copying that we already have makes the use of digital technology possible, but it also has uh, its limits. Uh, I, I just want to give you some examples from everyday life. Uh, imagine surveillance cameras, for, for example. Um, if a surveillance camera in a country that doesn't have a freedom of panorama exception is uh, pointed at a public artwork, uh, is it producing a copyright infringement? Uh, arguably, that depends on whether the security footage is immediately deleted or whether it is stored for review later, whether it's a temporary copy or not. And uh, another exception that could possibly apply is that of incidental inclusion, but also that doesn't exist anywhere. So um, uh, definitely you need to do some copyright gymnastics uh, that are necessary in order to bring everyday digital technologies into conformity with the reproduction right. The uh, same question poses itself with the Google Street View cars. Uh, the pictures of the facades uh, of buildings are definitely stored indefinitely uh, in the database uh, of Google Street View, but at least under the German freedom of panorama exception, the le legality is actually quite questionable because uh, the pictures are not made by a photographer who is standing in a public space, but they're rather high above the ground. So uh, the point I want to make here is uh, I don't want to question whether street surveillance is legal or whether Google Street View is legal and not even whether they should be legal. Uh, what I want to question is whether copyright should be the law that decides this. The digital revolution means that increasingly our perception is going to be mediated through digital technology and increasingly that will not be limited to people with sight or hearing loss. I'm talking about everything from 
hearing enhancement headphones, VR goggles, touch sensors, or simply smartphone cameras that will increasingly become part of all of our lives. And uh, I think the mere perception of the world around us, be it aided through digital technology or not, it was never supposed to be covered by copyright in the first place. But this is exactly what the equation of digital copies and analog copies today achieves. So, as technology pro progresses, every few years we have to introduce a new exception to copyright to maintain the overall balance. But uh, every time it's a huge struggle with powerful lobbies trying to stop change that is merely intended to keep the reach of copyright within its limits. The next exception after the text and data mining is already on the horizon. Um, distributors of digital content on the internet are complaining that in order to run their streaming services and to stream video to customers, it's not enough to secure the right of communication to the public. They also have to clear the reproduction right, and this is not always held by the same company. Um, so the demand is now to make a new exception that if somebody already has cleared the right of communication to the public, the reproduction rights should be incidental to that, should be uh, implied in so far as it's necessary to facilitate the communication to the public. So I have to wonder if we continue making exceptions for the same purpose, that is uh, to limit uh, the damage that is done by digital uh, uh, reproduction right to the way that technology works, why can't we instead reform the exclusive right? What does the re reproduction right achieve? Uh, arguably, I think it's primarily a tool for enforcement of the law in the analog space. So, for example, if somebody has 20,000 copies of a book in their basement, um, you want to be able to go after them and not wait until they actually start tw selling those 20,000 copies. And you also want to be able to make an injunction and seize those works. But um, the, the uh, situation on the internet, I think, is fundamentally different. Uh, how does it translate to digital copying? It's, imagine you have a, a rogue film distributor that offers streaming services on the, over the internet without having a license. Of course, that streaming service does not have 20,000 copies of the work stored on his hard drive and uh, is incrementally sending out one of them and then deleting it from their own hard drive. So there is no benefit for the enforcement of the law. On the contrary, the copy is actually only created at the very moment in which the act of communication to the public takes place, and there is no copy until the customer requests one. So all the benefits of the analog reproduction right actually do not apply to digital copying. So do the reasons that made us build our entire copyright system on the foundation of the act of copying actually still make sense in the digital world? Do the benefits justify the massive collateral damage to the development of digital technology? These are questions that can hardly be answered through a European copyright reform because, of course, the reproduction right is enshrined into international treaties. Um, there are other examples where the international framework constrains the evidence-based copyright reform, um, looking at some of the uh, examples of evidence that has been given by Professor Kretschmer, uh, two radical and effective ways of addressing the problem of non-use of works that uh, we have seen, the so-called 20th century black hole, would be either a drastic shortening of copyright terms or making the copyright terms uh, dependent on a work registration after a certain point. Of course, both these options are incompatible with the Berne Convention. So, what is a politician to do when faced with these international constraints? Uh, it seems to be that uh, the recommendation of the day is to cut ourselves off from the world, uh, to leave all those international conventions behind and just do our own things. I think uh, it takes just a brief glance at the state of copyright in Europe today to see what a terrible idea that would be. Next to all the problems that uh, may arise from an overreach of copyright or an incompatibility with uh, digital technology, all those problems, I believe, pale in significance to those problems that simply stem from the lack of harmonization of copyright. Any transnational project that we're trying to uh, take uh, to do today, be it a research project or a common business, or simply making a film together with uh, actors from different countries, would turn into a bureaucratic nightmare if our national copyright system had nothing in common. And I don't imagine that uh, Britain's trade relations would benefit from telling Disney that, uh, sorry, British copyright only applies to British works, which uh, was exactly the situation before we had international treaties. So as Britain plans to withdraw from the EU, people will find that uh, the UK will not be an island and that uh, it's not possible to just compromise, not compromise with anyone 
uh, and that you have to find uh, common ground, but this will be much more difficult uh, for everyone involved. National sovereignty in a globalized world is an illusion and a dangerous one at that. The way to take control of one's destiny is not to close one's eyes and to hope that the world will disappear. It's to take the democratic debate to the higher level. So the future of copyright will not lie with those who will simply try to leave the international system of compromises that have been struck in the past. Those treaties are not going anywhere. But uh, simply hoping that the internet will go away and so will the challenges for copyright is also not going to work. So I believe in the worst case, if we don't overcome our inability to shape the law and our, uh, um, the, yeah, the, the real uh, slowing down of legislative progress that we have seen in the EU in recent years that I think has also uh, led to a lot of frustrations. I think if we don't fix that, uh, the worst case, business and technology will just develop outside the legal framework and the public ability to make rules for our society will dwindle. Uh, you could argue that, uh, for example, Google's content ID system is already a mandatory copyright register where the only way to benefit financially is to give Google a copy of your work and the rights holder information. And virtually all professional music rights holders are participating in this mandatory copyright register. So uh, we can argue whether that arrangement is beneficial for the rights holders or not. But if we're going to allow it, why should we forbid it for the public hand and uh, give effectively Google an information monopoly over rights holder information? If we continue to muddle along with addressing the problems of our democratic decision makings uh, without uh, making any real change, the future of copyright, uh, I think, will be shaped by bilateral trade agreements that uh, the public has little say about, uh, that depart from the system of the World Intellectual Property Organization where all affected parties have a seat at the table. There are already quite grave concerns about the impact of intellectual property rights on developing countries. And uh, I highly recommend in this context uh, the, the work by the former UN Special Rapporteur for Cultural Rights, Farida Shahid, who has really demonstrated these uh, problems for uh, developing countries that need to be addressed. So cutting developing countries out of the rulemaking process and relying exclusively on bilateral trade agreements could lead to a system of even greater exploitation and inequality. I think the multilateralism and transnational organizations that we have are a great achievement that need to be used in order to maintain their relevance. They need greater engagement from academia and civil society in order to be legitimate. In the best case, the future of copyright will lie in a broad global re-engagement with international law. We don't need to burn the Berne Convention, but we certainly need to reform it. The ban on formalities, the long copyright terms, or the reproduction right that are elements that stand in the way of a modern copyright, then, uh, we must not accept them as simply God-given and throw up our hands in exasperation and say that nothing can be done about that because it's international law. We need to start a global debate about the next generation of copyright treaties, what they will look like, which elements of the international framework have stood the test of time, and which need to be revisited. And the pioneers of this movement will not be the so-called creative industries, but people like Manon Ress, like James Love and Dan Pescott, who have pioneered the Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind, that is when they were not working on ensuring people's access to life-saving generic medicines. They've shown that uh, the impossible is actually possible, that copyright issues can be fixed at the highest political level. And uh, they have passed what uh, will be the first copyright treaty that uh, ensures access to knowledge and culture for uh, blind people and people with uh, vision disabilities. Um, it will take many years until the next step, I believe, but we should start working on it today. Meanwhile, the work in the European Union won't stop, but it will be much harder without the UK at the negotiating table. Uh, I think it's no secret that ideologically I'm not close to the Tories, but uh, they have been an important ally in building a solid evidence base for copyright reform and making it relevant in the policy debate. Uh, they've been allies in pushing for common sense copyright exceptions such as freedom of panorama and in warding off terrible ideas like the ancillary copyright for press publishers. And I think that's just the smallest reason why I regret the UK's decision to leave the EU. I hope that yesterday's vote will not mark a return to nationalism, that Britain will remain engaged in the international fora, 
and ultimately strengthen its commitment to making decisions with a global impact together. Your work with CREATE will be more important than ever to facilitate that. The evidence cannot tell us what we ought to do, for uh, these are decisions based on values. But evidence is all the more important if we want to work together across borders to understand each other and to make responsible decisions. Thank you. I'm uh, very grateful to Martin for the work that he has shepherded through CREATE over the last few years. Um, Martin and I were friends and colleagues long before he took over uh, that post, and I have seen him working virtually night and day over the last few years to try and help create the evidence base he's been describing. And I'm very grateful to Julia for providing her thoughts and uh, emphasising the importance of international, uh, the international regime and uh, raising the possibility of, of reform of it. And I, will, I might talk a little bit about that in a moment. In the short term, I thought that uh, I had been planning to talk about the, why Martin's work was great but irrelevant, because all the policy making going on in Europe is not being done by the Commission or the European Parliament. It's being done really by the Court of Justice of the European Union. And the Court of Justice of the European Union doesn't really have very good access to empirical data. The references arise from litigation. And uh, although we don't know what member states say in their submissions, because those aren't publicly available, uh, which of course is one of the shameful things that is wrong with the European Union, uh, that those things are not available, we don't actually know what evidence uh, the Court of Justice gets when it's developing and deepening uh, copyright policy for Europe in very dramatic and important ways. But because of what's happened, I've decided not to talk about that, but to just talk a little bit about how I see the future of UK copyright law uh, after Brexit. So in the short term, as all of you know, uh, it seems very likely that the government will trigger uh, the Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union and negotiation processes will start uh, to exit from the U European Union. And that is uh, presumptively a two-year timeline and for that period, or if some earlier or later period is negotiated, uh, the UK will remain bound by EU law and bound by the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So for a while, nothing will change, obviously. Uh, things might change implicitly. Things might change like, for example, the way in which uh, the IPO and the government operate in the working parties, uh, their views about pursuing particular British interests and whether it's worthwhile to do that. And European policy may end up being the poorer for the absence of that input. And in due course, certain forms of litigation decisions relating to uh, pursuing references, which take a considerable amount of time, uh, may lead to fewer references from the ECJ, to the ECJ from the UK during this period, uh, because uh, it is uh, not going to be uh, interesting to the parties to get a result at a point after which uh, EU law no longer binds the UK. So in, that's the short term. Uh, things will change, but they'll change rather subtly and often on the basis of individual decisions. In the medium to long term, we know that there are two potential strategies, uh, two obvious strategies that have been mooted by the Brexiteers. The first, which seems on its face very unattractive to most people who seem to have uh, voted for Brexit out of uh, concerns over immigration and the free movement of goods, would be to adopt the Norwegian model and to become a member of uh, the European economic area. Uh, the implications of that for copyright, well, the, the reason why that's not likely to be of huge interest is because being a member of the EA comes with free movement of persons. And insofar as that's regarded as a fundamental tenet of the Brexit uh, ideology, 
uh, it, it will be unattractive. If, however, we do go down that route, the effect is that we will have to adopt all European Union legislation that is regarded as being of EEA relevance. And that includes all copyright legislation, all existing copyright legislation. And the process has been that as new copyright legislation has added, uh, the processes by which the EEA system uh, determines whether uh, a, a piece of legislation is of EEA relevance have applied to copyright rules. So, for example, the Orphan Works legislation or the uh, Collective Management of Rights legislation, they're all texts of EEA relevance. So, if we went down that route, we continue to be bound by EU law. We're not subject to references to the Court of Justice, but we would be subject to references or uh, we would, our courts would make references to the European uh, Free Trade Association Court, the EFTA Court, as uh, Norway, Liechtenstein and Iceland uh, currently do. Uh, on the other hand, we would be, while we would be bound by these laws, uh, uh, we would have much less influence in shaping them. There is a process called decision shaping that allows inputs at various points in the process for EFTA sorry, EEA member states, uh, but it is not the same as sitting around the bargaining table, sitting around the council, having MEPs, etc. So it is more of what we have already and continue to have without the influence. But as I say, that is actually uh, the least likely option in my view. Instead, what's more likely is some sort of association agreement and association agreements have been entered into by the EU with many uh, territories, mostly surrounding the EU area, but not, not solely. And they all contain some form of intellectual property provisions, but they tend to be at a more general level than uh, the provisions, uh, uh, than the sorts of things within the EEA, which require you to adopt a specific legislation. So, for example, the Bosnia-Herzegovina Association Agreement of June, 20, which came into operation in June 2015, uh, requires Bosnia-Herzegovina to provide measures uh, of a level similar to that existing in the community. And there are certain more specific requirements, signing up to international treaties, and uh, an indication that equivalent uh, standards in terms of remedies mean standards that correspond to those under the EU enforcement directive. So it would still mean if we went down this route some influence uh, from the EU on UK law, but by no means uh, the same level as uh, uh, under an EEA agreement, under the, under the EEA. So that would give what all Brexiteers think they're getting, more freedom, hurrah, we would be able, in theory, to uh, adopt the recommendations of the Gower's review or Hargreaves review that we have a transformative use or fair use defense. We would not, it seems, have to go uh, to convince Brussels to get that. Equally, we could have a commercial data mining, text and data mining exception uh, uh, in theory, because we would not be limited by the scientific research exception uh, within the Information Society Directive. Whether the UK will take advantage of that freedom, I very much doubt. Uh, uh, Julia has hinted at some reasons why. We're still caught in uh, a complex system of international rules that already exist. And we will also become subject to other international regimes as the UK tries to enter into bilateral trade agreements uh, with different countries around the world. And here our experiences as a relatively small nation with relatively little to offer compared to the, U U U U to the EU is that we will not be able to resist some of the demands of big markets like the United States. So we can expect models like that in, of the US-Australia free trade agreement from 2004, which in chapter 17 contained all sorts of provisions that Australia was required to adopt. Life plus 70 for copyright work, 70 years for phonograms. Rules prohibiting 
Rules prohibiting rules that limited the transferability of copyright, like rules giving unwaivable rights of remuneration to authors, banned under the Australia Free Trade Agreement, detailed rules on, tra uh, on technological protection measures, and so on. Surprisingly detailed, more prescriptive than the Information Society Directive's provisions on these things. And there is a brilliant critique about the resentment this generated within Australia by Robert Burrell and Kimberly Weatherall that you can find on the web, published in 2007. As Julia says, the freedom is likely to be an illusion and uh, therefore not uh, something that was worth getting at all and the influence that we're giving up to get this freedom, unfortunately, is very significant. That means that UK law, UK copyright law, will become a pretty idiosyncratic irrelevance in the world. Comparative lawyers will look around and have a look at how British copyright law was doing in the 2020s and 2030s. The big players are going to be the EU and the United States. Those are going to be the ones that influence uh, the rules under which the cultural industries and information industries operate. Um, one final point, because I, I think I've now probably gone beyond what I should have done. Um, one final point. We will have a very odd period. We will have an odd period because it's very unlikely that the UK is going to legislate on copyright. We will keep, because the government's going to have plenty of things to do over the next few years. So we will keep laws that have been de developed and drafted being underpinned by e EU rules. And we will know that their legislative history is that they were supposed to implement EU norms. And we will know that the, there will be huge amounts of jurisprudence from the Court of Justice interpreting those rules. But we will no longer be bound by the interpretations of the Courts of Justice on those rules. So we will be in a weird period, I think for decades to come, of looking to ECJ rulings as persuasive authorities and never quite knowing how persuasive they are going to be. And I think that is one of many unfortunate consequences of yesterday's vote for copyright. So thank you.